Well, welcome everybody. Wow, what a difference a week makes, right? Can you believe it? Yeah. Hey, I want to welcome you here at Woodbury. also uh, want to welcome those of you joining us right now at our Hastings campus, our Cottage Grove campus, and our Egan campus. Let's just say welcome! We are in week two. We were supposed to be in week three, but no one showed up last weekend. Uh, So we are in week two uh, of a series we're calling I Quit. And I don't know how you feel about the title of the series, I Quit. Some people think immediately, it doesn't sound very Jesus-like. You know, I quit, like I give up, I wave the white flag, I'm done. Shouldn't we be having a more Jesus-like sermon series? Because he wasn't a quitter. Shouldn't we be in a series called I Refuse to Quit? Like I'll Never Quit? Uh, so I, I, I get that, but what we're learning in this series and what we will be learning in this series to, as the days come by is that sometimes, I know we've heard all our lives, quitters never win, quitters never win, but sometimes, and you're going to find this to be true, sometimes we have to quit in order to win. Sometimes the only way we can move forward in our lives is by quitting. And that's certainly true in today's topic. Because today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about I quit religion. Now, I don't know how that hits you right there. When you look at that, some of you are scratching your head like, what what are you talking about here? I thought that's what this was all about. I thought that this whole thing of gathering and this whole thing, we're, we're having a religious experience right now, aren't we? Isn't Crossroads part of Christianity? And isn't Christianity part of religion? What are you talking about, Pastor Phil? And I get it. I get it. It, I think it's very easy for us to put what we're all about as Christians into this category, into this classification called religion. But, 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 if you actually read the teachings of Jesus, what you're going to discover is that Jesus didn't come to start a religion. Jesus came to put an end to religion. Now, Before you start throwing things at me, like your Bible, which is not very Jesus-like to do, I I just might add that, all right? Before you throw things at me, let me just say that religion is something that we, human beings, have created. In fact, here's my definition. Religion is mankind's, mankind's attempt to please or to get right with God. It's us saying, okay, we've got to make ourselves right with this God of ours. And the best snapshot I can give you of religion is this ladder. Because the thinking is God's up there somewhere, we're down here somewhere, and we've got to climb, 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 strive, 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 strive. We've got to work our way up to God because God's mad at us. This is what religion says. God is mad at you. God is ticked off at you because you didn't come to church last week when there's a blizzard. God's mad at you for messing up this last week. God's mad at you for all those sins. God's mad at you. So you got to work your way up to God. That's the thinking of religion. That's the premise of religion. And each one of those rungs on the ladder, and each religion is different here, but each religion has their rungs of the ladder. You got to do this, and you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this, you got to do that. You got to do these rites, these rituals, these routines. You got to obey these rules. You got to obey these regulations. And the th- thought of religion is if we keep doing all those things, that hopefully someday God will do, you're good. You've done enough. Well done. You've made up for all that bad stuff you did. That's the thinking of religion. Religion. Now, the motto of religion, the motto of religion is try harder. It's try harder. And and you know this, if you're into religion, and some of you, this is all you know is religion. You you know that the motto of religion, try harder, try harder. And you constantly find yourself striving and climbing and trying to do more so that, again, God won't be so mad at you. And that's why religious people are always tired. Religious people are always tired because they're always messing up and then they know they've got to negate all their messings ups with some good things. Get back up on the ladder, keep climbing. The motivation of religion, and some of you know this all too well, is fear and guilt and its kissing cousin whose name is shame. 
This is what keeps the wheels of religion going round and round and round and round and round. We're afraid. We're afraid. Religion takes up us captive. And we're afraid that if we get off the ladder and quit striving, that God's even going to be more mad at us. If we get off the religion and quit doing all the rites, rules, rit rituals, regulations, whatever, that there's hell to pay. Literally hell to pay. And I'm here to tell you, Crossroads Church, at all of our campuses, that Jesus came to put an end to that. To all that kind of thinking. Now, let me clarify. Those rungs of the ladder, the things that religion tells us to do, 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 all the hoops to jump through, they're not all bad. Oftentimes, those are good things that religion's calling us to do. So I, I don't want you to hear me saying that all those things that religion says to do are all bad. No, they're only bad if they get in the way of what Jesus came to earth and died on a cross and rose from a grave to give us. When those things get in the way of the real thing, and the real thing is not religion, the real thing is a relationship with God the Father through his son Jesus Christ, when, when rules and rituals and rites and regulations, when all those things get in the way of me knowing God personally through his son Jesus, then that religion, whatever it is, has gone wrong. And we need to quit that. We need to quit that. We need to wave the white flag and get out of that. Now, the church that I grew up in, I've talked a lot about the church that I grew up in, and I usually talk about it in negative terms. And so I want to go on record to say that the church of my youth did certain things well. Potlucks. They did potlucks <laughs> really well, really, really well. Uh, beyond potlucks, um, I don't know, I'll think of something. But just, just so you know, I, I also want to speak highly right now of the church of my youth because I found Jesus there. I did. I took my very first spiritual baby step in that church. But here's the deal. It took me years and years and years and years and years before I did that because that church had become infiltrated by religion. And what religion does is it distorts us. It, it, it pushes us away sometimes from what it's all about. Why Jesus came to earth. And I'll say it again. It's not about rules, rituals, rites, regulations. It's all about a relationship. That's why Jesus came. And what religion can do is get in the way of that. And it makes it all kind of distorted and cloudy and murky. And that's why today, if you're into religion, I want you to seriously consider it today before you walk out of all of our campuses just to say, I quit religion. And here's why. Because God has something much greater than religion for you. And I want to show you, I want us to discover today what that is. And so let's get right to it, okay? Because we got some baptisms to do. Uh, but let's grab Bibles right now, okay? Would you grab a Bible with me? Um, and if you didn't bring a Bible, it's okay. There's Bibles in the chair racks below you. We're going to go to a book in the Bible called Philippians. We're going to go to chapter 3. It's around page 900 at all of our campuses. And as you're turning to this book of Philippians, let me just say it's not really a book. It's actually a letter, that Paul, this great apostle, this great missionary of the first century world who met Jesus, he, he planted a bunch of churches uh, and he wrote much of our New Testament. He actually wrote a letter to this church that he started in a town called Philippi. And this is where we get the, the book of the Bible called Philippians, all right? And Paul wrote this letter because something had happened. There, there was a group of people who infiltrated this church that Paul started in Philippi. And what they start, started to peddle, what they started to push was religion. They started to say to the people in Philippi that Jesus, what he did is not enough. Oh, Jesus, yeah, he died, he rose, oh, good, good, good. But Jesus is not enough. You need more than Jesus. That's what they were saying. And Paul hears about this. He's 800 miles away from Philippi. And he hears about what these people are pushing, i.e. religion. And he sits down. He's not very happy. And he writes this letter to them. And we're going to pick it up. Philippians chapter 3, verse 2. Here's what Paul writes. He says, watch out for those dogs. Those people who do evil. Those mutilators who say that you must be circumcised 
to be saved. Now, let's just stop right here because you can tell, I hope you can tell from the tone already that Paul's a little upset with these people. He calls them dogs. By the way, this is not dogs like Randy Jackson, American Idol. Hey, dog, how you doing? It's not that kind of dog. No, he's referring, Paul's referring, and this would have been known in the first century world, about there was these packs of these vicious, wild dogs roaming the streets that, that, that they were scary. And Paul's calling these people who are, who have peddling this message, he's calling them dogs. He also calls them what? Over here, mutilators. Because one thing that they're saying to all these Gentiles, these Gentiles, these men, Gentile men who are jumping on the Jesus bandwagon, who are all of a sudden putting their faith and hope in Jesus, what they're saying to these Gentile men, these mutilators were, okay, it's nice that you found Jesus, but on top of Jesus, you need to be circumcised. In other words, if you really want to get into the Jesus club, you must be cut. You must be cut. You must be circumcised, which was a Jewish, a Jewish right. It was one of the Jewish rungs of the ladder. And they're saying to these Gentile who, who are becoming Christians, you've got you to follow this Jewish right. And Paul, you can just see him as he's hearing about this. Just try to picture Paul. Uh, he didn't have a big pen or whatever. He didn't have a computer. But he, you just picture him writing, like shaking his head. He's mad at these people as he writes the next verse. He says, for we, we, who worship by the Spirit of God. In other words, it's not a thing, a physical thing. It's not an external thing. This is all about an internal thing. This is all about the heart is what he's saying. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus, not ourselves, but on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Now, what's Paul saying? This is so important you get this. He's saying, oh, okay, you want to get right with God? You want God to smile upon you? You want God to approve of you? You want God to accept you into his forever family? You want your sins to be forgiven? Okay, well, then don't rely on human effort. Paul's saying, that, and this is the essence of religion. Religion says you want all those things? You want to be right with God? Then you better get on the ladder and climb, climb, climb. Strive, strive, strive. It's all about effort, huffing and puffing, okay? And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. No, we don't put any confidence in human effort. That, that's not the way, that's not the way we become right with God. Go back, go back to verse 3. He says, we, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We have no, no confidence in human effort, which is the opposite of religion. Because look up here. Religion says, if it's going to be, it's up to me. If I'm going to, whatever, God's mad at me. If I'm going to get God to quit, quit being mad at me. If I'm going to get God to give me thumbs up. I don't know why I'm talking so fast. I'm going to slow down a little bit. Uh, but if, if I'm going to get myself, you know, on the right side of God's ledger sheet, I, I, it's up to me. And the Bible and Paul is saying, no, 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 no. It's not about you. It's not up to you. It's up to Jesus. It's up to Jesus. It's not up to you. Religion says, try harder. Try harder. The Bible says, stop trying and trust Jesus. Religion says, the next one says, get up on the ladder and climb up to God. Get on that ladder and start climbing. The Bible, Paul, Christianity says, get off the stinking ladder. Because Jesus has come down to us. Amen. You see, friends, you have to understand something. That we don't have to climb up to God. Why? Because God climbed down to, God descended down to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And then Jesus climbed up on something. Do you remember what he climbed up on? Was it a ladder? Let me think for a second. No. It was called a, a cross. Jesus climbed up on a cross and bled and died so that it would no longer be up to me or up to you. Jesus dying on the cross for our sins is what Paul is pointing to here. That's why we don't have to strive. That's why we don't have to climb. That's why we don't have to work ourselves up to God because God has come down to us and done the unthinkable for us. And if anybody, though, if anybody could have relied on their own human effort, it would have been the Apostle Paul. In fact, that's what Paul kind of hints at next in this passage. Let's, let's get back to it. Verse 4. Indeed, he says, if others have a reason for confidence in their own efforts, their own religiosity, 
their own ladder climbing abilities. He says, I, I, hey, I would have had confidence. I would have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the dun 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 Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law. Look at this. Without fault. Paul's saying, hey, you want to see a spiritual resume? Let me show you mine. Let me just go ahead and toot my religious horn here for a few minutes with you. He's saying, hey, you want to talk about race? Nailed it. Nailed it. I'm a, I'm a pure-blooded Hebrew. I was a member of the elite tribe of Benjamin. And everybody would have gone, oh. He says, you want to talk about rights? You want to talk about rights? I was circumcised as the Old Testament law says you're supposed to do on the eighth day. Not the seventh day, not the ninth day, but on the eighth day. I eat only kosher foods. I, re I observe all of the Jewish festivals. And you want to talk about rules, Paul says? <laughs> I was a member of this small group of rule keepers par excellence, which were called the Pharisees. You want to talk about obeying all the laws? I did it, Paul says. And, and, and Paul's like, hey, you have to understand something. If anybody, if anybody, if anybody could have put confidence in their own efforts, in what they are all about, Paul's like, look at me, look at me, look at me. I was the ultimate spiritual high achiever, Paul says. I am the king of the ladder climbers, Paul says. But then, but then, but then, Paul met Jesus. But then Paul traded all of his religion in for a relationship with Jesus. that changed everything. And Paul writes about that next. Verse 7, I once thought these things were valuable. All the climbing and all the rungs of the ladder. I once thought all those things, obeying all the laws, doing all the rites, all the routines, etc. They were valuable, but now I consider them worthless. Because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, for his sake. Paul's saying, for his sake, I quit religion. To know Jesus, I quit religion. I have discarded everything else, counting it all as, say this word out loud, everybody. One, two, three. Garbage. garbage. Yeah, counting it all as garbage. So that I could gain Christ and become one with him. Do you see what Paul's saying? He's saying, oh, you can play the religious game. You can, you can, you can nail religion to a T. You can, you can get the t-shirt and, you know, and go around, I, I'm a religious person or whatever. But Paul says, in, in comparison with actually knowing Jesus Christ personally, entering into a life-changing relationship with him, Paul says all that other stuff that religion offers you, he compares it to what? Starts with a G. Garbage. It's all garbage. Now, the New Testament, the New Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, were written in Greek. And we have been very kind as we've translated the Greek word that we translate garbage. We've been very kind. Because the literal Greek word that you don't have, because we've translated it for you, is the Greek word skubala, skubala. And what that word literally means is not garbage. That's way too kind. L let me describe skubala for you, okay? If you ever watch people now in our suburban neighborhoods walking their dog, and their dog goes over to somebody else's yard and makes a deposit, you know what I'm talking about? Makes a deposit. The owner, the pet owner, reaches down with their plastic gloves and their plastic baggie and they scoop something up and put it into the plastic bag. <clears throat> Scubula. That's what it is. That's what the word literally means. It's dung, D-U-N-G. If chariots in the first century world had a bumper sticker, they would have read, Scubula happens. <laughs> I'm just teaching you the Bible, okay? I'm just giving you Bible words. You feel free to use the Bible word today if you want. It's totally up to you. Parents, do not email me. Um, 
<laughs> and what Paul's saying again, Paul's saying, hey, in comparison to Jesus, his grace, his mercy, his unconditional love that you don't have to earn, that you don't have to climb, you don't have to oh, all, all this do, all this do, do, do stuff of religion, he says it's just do, do. Go ahead and tweet that out. It's just do, do. That's what Paul's saying. And so can I ask you, Crossroads, can I ask you, have you come to that conclusion? Have you got to the point where you have discarded religion for Jesus? Where you have traded in your religion and you have begun a relationship with Jesus Christ? Or are you still on the ladder? You still think, oh, God's mad at me. I got to keep climbing. I got to keep trying harder and trying harder and trying harder. I got to keep, I got to keep, I got to keep, I got to keep. I got to keep all those religious balls in the air. I got to keep jumping through all the religious hoops because I don't want God to be mad at me any longer. I just want to say to you, friends, if, if you're still there, it's time to do what Paul did. It's time to do what Paul the Apostle did. It's time to get off the ladder. And it's time to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, Paul did that. Verse 9. This is his, his kind of his coming to Jesus moment here. He said, I no longer count on my righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith. Putting my faith, my weight, my hope in Christ. I become righteous. I become righteous through faith in Christ for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. It depends on faith. Not me working hard. It depends on me putting my faith in Jesus. My weight, my hope in Jesus. In, in other words, there's only, there's only two ways of, of potentially getting right with God. There's only two ways of, of, of God doing this for, for you and for me. Religion has an answer and the Bible has an answer. There's only two ways. Religion says do, 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 do. In, in Christianity, the Bible says something completely different. And because I know that many of us have grown up with religion, I know that the majority of the Crossroads campuses are filled with people that all you've had, all you've been taught, all your life is do, do, do because God's mad at you and you got to do this and guilt, fear, shame, whatever. I want to, before we walk out of our campuses today, I want to make this perfectly clear. I don't want anybody walking out today scratching their head saying, I'm still not sure what the difference is between religion and Christianity. So what I've done for you, I've put a chart together. I made a chart all by myself and it took me hours to do and I want to share the chart with you right now because the chart is going to make it abundantly clear what religion says versus what Christianity says so let's get right to it religion says versus Christianity says religion says you ready for this save yourself get on a ladder and climb 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 Christianity says nah accept Jesus' free gift of salvation religion says it's up to me. Christianity says, no, 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 no. It's up to Jesus. Religion says, do, do, do. Christianity says, it's done, done, done. What's the last thing that Jesus said before he died hanging on a cross? He said, it is finished. It's finished. It's done. It's done. You don't have to do any more. I done it for you. He didn't actually say that, but that's what he did. He did it for us. Religion says, earn it. Christianity says, no, I'll receive it. It's a gift. Religion says, try harder. Christianity says, stop trying and rest. Rest. Religion says, get it right. Christianity says, Jesus is there when you get it wrong. Religion says, be miserable. Christianity says, be grateful. And the last one, I think, sums it up best. Christianity or religion says make a deal with God. Christianity says take the deal and follow Jesus. And I think that last comparison there is what it all comes down to. Are we going to continue the rest of our lives trying to make a deal with God? Because we keep sinning. We keep messing up. So we're going to keep trying to make a deal with God to get right with God. Or are we going to listen to Paul? Are we going to listen to the Bible? Are we going to listen to what Christianity, what Jesus says, and just take the deal? 
God sent his son to die on a cross to be raised from a tomb. That's the deal. That's the offer. It's a gift. What are we going to do? What will you do? Now, Paul didn't just write one letter to one church. He wrote many letters to many churches that he started. And I want to read just a very short uh, verse or two from uh, a letter that he wrote to a church in Rome. This is Romans chapter 3. Paul writes this. Here, you, got, you got to check this out. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, I love the word grace, don't you? God's riches at Christ's expense. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right. He freely makes, he, we don't make our, he makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they, what? When they believe. When they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. Wow. That's so good. Paul, thank you for making it crystal clear. Because what Paul is doing for us is Paul is telling us why the game of religion is a game that you can't win. Because God has a standard. He said, he said, God has a standard, and what do we do? We all fall short of God's standard, right? You do and I do. The Bible says we all fall short. Paul says we all fall short of God's standard. Why? Because God's standard, because God is holy, God's standard is perfection. And I don't know about you, but I was mathematically eliminated from perfection a long time ago. <laughs> and so were you. And so were you. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. You may be a great person. I mean, you, you, may, you, you may be way up here somewhere with, with Billy Graham and Mother Teresa, or you may be way down here somewhere with Phil Print. I don't know where you're at. But the bottom line is, friends, none of us, none of us can get up to God's standard. God's standard is too high. And our sins are too great. No one, no one, we all fall short and that's why God sent Jesus. To do what I couldn't do. And to do what all of you couldn't do. Which, is, which was to live a perfect sinless life. Jesus did that. And on the cross, guess what he was doing? He was taking on our guilt. And he was handing us his goodness as a gift. On the cross, Jesus wasn't dying for his sins. He was dying for yours. And he was dying for mine. To make us, to make us right with God. It's a gift. It's a gift. You don't have to stay on the ladder. It's not up to you. You don't have to strive and climb and feel guilty and shame. No, you just accept, you accept the gift. You accept the deal. You don't have to make a deal with God. You accept the deal that God has made through his son, Jesus Christ. You see what religion was unable to do, Jesus did. You can get off the ladder. You can stop huffing and stop puffing and stop going nuts, trying to get yourself right with God. But Pastor Phil, but Pastor Phil, I've messed up so bad and I keep on messing up all the time. And the good news is God knew that already. And that's why God sent Jesus. Because Jesus is the answer to every mess that you and I have ever made. And he's the answer to every mess that you and I will ever make in the future. So take the deal. Take the deal. Get off the ladder. Jesus has done it for you. Accept it. Accept it. Humbly accept his offer of forgiveness, his, his, his offer of new life, his offer of being part of his forever family. Just accept the offer, okay? Let me pray. And if you're here today at one of our campuses in you know it's time for you to quit religion. It's time for you to give up religion and it's time for you to begin a relationship, a life-changing, 
relationship with Jesus, then I would invite you right now, just in your heart, to say, Jesus, just in your heart, say, Jesus, I put my faith in you. I put my hope in you. Jesus, I accept your gift of mercy and forgiveness. I take the deal. Just say that. Just say it to him. I take the deal. I accept your sacrifice for me. And today, Jesus, today, I begin my relationship with you. And now for all of us in this, in all of our campuses, maybe you took the deal years ago, maybe you took the deal decades ago, maybe you've had a relationship with Jesus for a long time, and if you have, what I want you to do is just to join me right now and just taking a deep breath and then let it out. Another one. And let it out. What you just experienced, that breath you just took, is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Just like your salvation, just like your forgiveness, just like your right standing with God is a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift that you've received. And so would you right now just join me as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. Would you just smile right now? And would you just, under your breath right now, just say, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Jesus. And Father God, we do thank you for Jesus. For this one who, who descended, who came to earth, and who died like a criminal for us. And we are grateful people. Grateful for what he's done on our behalf. And so God, we thank you and we praise you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody together said, Amen. Hey, if you, just, um, if you just took that step, if you just quit religion and you just began a relationship with Jesus, I just want to say to you, way to go. We are so proud of you. Uh, we praise God for you. Uh, I, I just want you to know that you've made the wisest decision that you'll ever make. Today is your spiritual birthday. Today is the day that you began that relationship with Jesus. And what you do next, one of the next things that you do after you say yes to Jesus is you take it public. You let everybody know, your friends, your family know that you, that you are following Jesus now. And one way we demonstrate that is by jumping into the waters of baptism. Ba baptism is going public with your decision to follow Jesus. And I know baptism is a confusing thing for lots of people. And so we have put our smartest person uh, the, our, our wisest biblical scholar in trying to explain what baptism is for you. So with that in mind, here's our Bible scholar, Henry. Watch his story. My name is Henry, and, and I'm five and a half. I just have a bunch of brains, like a bunch of invisible brains. Invisible brains? <laughs> yeah. So I just like... Then, um, that, then I have a math brain, and I have all those brains, so I need to change my brain to happy brain. Mommy said that um, she got baptized because she wanted to show everyone that she loved Jesus. I said, I want, I want to get baptized too, Mommy. When can I get baptized? I couldn't do it for six months. I was feeling like so happy because I was gonna, because I was gonna show that I love God and I was gonna show that I was gonna wash my sins away. So for those six months, I read the Bible and 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 sang songs to God to make him happy. So um, I was wearing I was wearing like like Ninja Turtle goggles, 
And then I, then I was wearing this shirt. Then I was wearing Captain America swimming trunks. And then, then it was like so fun. In the back, I'm a, I'm a, before I got baptized, I we prayed with my, I prayed with my mommy. Before I got baptized, I felt God in my heart. I was so excited to get baptized, I wanted to go first. When I was in the pool, I felt, I felt the biggest smile ever. Uh, Eric Anderson baptized me. So now, start over, brain. So now, so, yeah. I'm ready. So, when I got baptized, I saw I I saw that I loved the Lord, that I loved Jesus. Another reason is why I got baptized, cause I is cause I'm showing Jesus that I'm following Him forever. If you love God like I love God, you should get baptized too.